diminish follicular genesis. So in patients with premature ovarian failure, which is called insufficiency and diminish ovarian reserves, then when they don't ovulate, then there is, you have to stimulate, get over them because the natural process uh, will not occur. Then the poor same quality. Now, sorry. when it comes to poor stream quality, now there are medical and surgical, now if you take uh, procedures that enhance uh, the outcome even without IVF. So um, uh, the medical and surgical conditions play, uh, surgical interventions play a major role in increasing uh, success of such patients without IVF. So poor semen quality alone is the sole cause in 20% of subfertile couples. And in, in addition, they, the uh, semen, poor semen quality contributes to another 20% extra when it com when compares, uh, combines with other causes. So if a cup, if, a, if there is a resistance to, or there is no uh, improvement from medical or surgical interventions, then uh, IVF can be recommended. Uh, then when it comes to endometriosis, laparoscopic surgery alone by uh, adesiolysis, drainage of ovarian endometriomas, restoration of anatomy, alone and uh, diatomizing laparoscopic, uh, diatomizing endometrial deposits alone uh, helps even without IVF. And laparoscopic surgery uh, enhances, uh, further enhances IVF positive outcome. Uh, so the controversies there are, uh, before coming to controversy, now indications, there are other indications for where you need uh, ovarian tissue preservation. So if a patient is undergoing oophorectomy and then you can preserve uh, uh, ovarian tissue or patient is undergoing gonadotoxic treatment where ovary, it will have a detrimental effect on ovarian tissues, uh, there is a place uh, the ovarian tissue can be uh, preserved and used subsequently. Then when there is obstructive azospermia testicular hyperfunction, now, um, this is where a genital uh, urinary surgeon has intervened and he cannot help. Then when there is obstructive azospermia or testicular hyperfunction, uh, IVF is very helpful. It's a main mode of successful fertilization. Now, um, but now if in going back to uh, indications um, now we have seen some very young girls without no history of any of these has just gone to a obstetrician uh, maybe two three times or four times and then somebody recommends uh, you go to so and so and then that person so these people they the, the IVF centers they have done IVF so it is wrong so, and also IVF cannot overcome the impact of age on oocyte function. So older the person is, the quality of oocytes are low and the fert uh, fertilizability is low and the implantation is also low. And also the, when the fertilizability uh, is low, the embryos are weak, are not healthy. And uh, as a result, uh, the M, uh, the success rates are low, live birth rates are low. So you can use uh, donor oocytes in such cases. So this, uh, so uh, I will first uh, talk to you about the slightly the process and where, where do these malpractices occur. Now, um, first, um, when a couple comes, uh, that is, there's a consultation. You have to test the couple. 
because is IVF indicated in every patient? Just because a patient comes, does IVF indicate it? Then if once you select the couple, next is ovarian stimulation. Hyper, that is, I will go into detail. Then there's a grid retrieval, then there's fertilization, then the embryo transfer. So, um, so they are the, in the team, there is an obstetrician or a subfertility specialist, and there's an embryologist and the lab team. So now where do these controversies start? Now, um, first, at the onset, when a couple comes, uh, uh, we, we need to assess. So the assessment, parts of the, part of the assessment is day three FSH, estradiol, anti-mullerian hormone, and the antral follicle count. So um, then um, uh, imaging. So uh, we have seen, uh, so the imaging of the uterus and adnexia where they are, even with IVF, there are conditions that does not need IVF, but a plain intervention. So now for example, best example here is fibroids and also uh, endometriosis, I have mentioned, uh, uh, desiolysis and restoration of anatomy, then adenomyosis, uterine anomalies, anomalies. Some of these conditions, the, the IVF will fail, or may very highly, highly unlikely to succeed. So the proper assessment, is the patient suitable for this procedure? Then the uterine cavity imaging, because the even if, IVF will fail in polyps, fibroids, additions, submucous fibroids, polyps, uh, and po fibroid polyps itself in the cavity and additions due to previous uh, ERPCs uh, or uterine septic. They will have a detrimental effect and um, uh, purely by correcting or by intervening to sort out these issues, uh, you will have, you can have pregnancies without IVF. Then a hormone profile, whether it is done because we know the thyroid fun, uh, home thyroids is uh, affects every most part of the fertility, most aspects of fertility, and also prolactin, androgen, cortisol. All these hormones uh, uh, affect uh, in a detrimental way. So, correcting the hormone uh, imbalance itself. Uh, is important and you can have spontaneous pregnancies without IVF and the on the other hand even if you go for IVF if when IVF is indicated really indicated these conditions unless you correct the IVF outcome will be poor and the infection screening so um, now HIV hepatitis B syphilis uh, then swabs uh, now whether this is needed for every IVF cycle and each time uh, uh, is another question. So restoration, so restoration of anatomy, correction of hormonal imbalance, optimization of BMI will alone alone is enough to increase IVF uh, success. Is alone enough to, uh, for pregnancies even without IVF. So if the patient is in need of IVF, still correction of anatomy, restoration, hormonal imbalance, optimization of BMI will positively help uh, the outcome. Now, uh, now we come to the controversies. Now, who should make the decision for IVF? Uh, so in Sri Lankan setup, is it a postgraduate institute of medicine board certified obstetrician and gynecologist or a fertility specialist is involved? Or if it is a doctor person from the IVF center or the IVF practitioners. So unfortunately, if you, the people who have gone for IVF, so people whose relations who have gone as doctors, you know, most IVF practitioners are 
neither obstetricians, neither, uh, neither obstetricians or gynecologists, neither they are fertility specialists, neither they, uh, they, uh, they have no form of um, certification for fertility, proper, what I mean is proper qualification. So, um, and most decisions are based on monetary decisions rather than on choice or choice for rather than the patient doesn't get the best choice. It's based on money. Um, what usually happens is, as I said earlier, when they come to, a, uh, when they undergo treatment and one of their friends will say, go to so-and-so. And this person will say, okay, you are, you, uh, the, uh, the best option is for you for IVF. And then they go for IVF without giving them proper information and counseling. So what are the proper, what is, what falls under the proper patient education? Then who, um, and who gives the accurate information? So the process. So most patients really don't know the process. They have not been explained. And they are not aware of success rate. They are not aware of the cost. And they don't know complications and side effects. I repeat, complications and side effects. And, uh, and unfortunately, we have no statutory uh, uh, law to govern this. And we don't have proper guidelines or protocols. So, um, Majority of IVF centers are run by people without proper qualification. So these people have some qualifications, so, but whether that person has had a proper postgraduate training, even the qualification, though the qualification is mentioned, none of them are registered or registrable in the post in with the Sri Lanka Medical Council because some of these uh, qualifications are entry criteria. You have entered a program, but not uh, completed. So the, uh, the consultants registered with the PJ, the uh, PJM, registered at the Sri Lanka Medical Council and degrees and training done by Postgraduate Institute for Medicine, they have completed. Whereas some of these people have entered training programs abroad but not completed. So they are neither IVF specialists or obstetricians or gynecologists in those countries. And, uh, but unfortunately, since the specialist registry is not completed, uh, they still continue to uh, mislead people. And uh, actually they impersonate, they impersonate at obstet uh, gynecologists or subfertility specialists. So, and also this, none of the, most of these IVS, I repeat, it's most, not all. So, uh, or they don't have no proper statistics. So they have no data for review for any professional colleges or uh, even for that matter, for somebody to go and get an idea how successful they are. Now, um, now what is the role of the embryologist? Now, this IVF, the, the, uh, there is the clinician, the gynecologist or the subfertility patient who does the clinical part of it. Then we have the um, uh, embryologist who does the embryology part of the uh, process. Now, uh, so that is the lab part of the embryo, the fertilization and um, and you know, once the oocytes are retrieved, it is handed over to the embryologist. And thereafter, the clinician comes again into the picture when it comes to embryo transfer. So uh, um, now uh, we know in some of these interventions are not done by clinicians. Some of these interventions are done by the IVF practitioners who are not properly qualified or trained. And uh, now, when it comes to uh, embryologists, what is the internationally accepted IVF? Uh, uh, what, is, uh, what is the global norm? Now, uh, are we having um, internationally accepted 
uh, 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 IVF practitioners? Are they having the proper qualification? Have they worked in these uh, uh, international laboratories? Have they at least not worked? Have they at least seen? Have they visited? Uh, so what is the standard? So most of the labs here, uh, the IVF centers, the, uh, um, the people who are there, I'm not referring to proper qualified embryologists who have had, who has the proper academic qualification, proper professional and properly registered and properly uh, trained. I'm referring to people who are impersonating and uh, lowering standards. As a result, the IVS successes will be very poor. So they call them, some of them call them clinical embryologists. And they see patients, uh, and they, uh, this is what I repeat, uh, repeatedly said, they impersonate as an obstetrician, a gynecologist or a subfertility specialist, but they consult. So with their MBBS license, they see patients, but they're not consultants, but they, uh, the, the controversy there is they pretend or impersonate as a consultant. And innocent patients, they come there, they are not given. I have given you the earlier their proper indications. So people who have had uh, not even had a laparoscopy or not even had a HST, hysterosalphic grammar or a laparoscopy where tubes are not uh, checked, uh, where they, uh, they have been um, subjected to IVF. And uh, then with regard to, uh, I would like to move to ovarian stimulation. So the, so the idea is superovulation. You give drugs for, um, to have multiple ovums so that you can retrieve them to be handed over to the uh, embryologist for uh, to be fertilized in a petri dish. So the stimulation protocols uh, have drugs containing GI, NRH, agonist, antagonist, and gonadotrophy, FSH is used. So um, now one controversy that here is now when there is now this part of the cycle, I am referring to genuinely, if a IVF is genuinely needed, yes, this stimulation protocol uh, is costly because the drugs are costly and you need the best drugs. And uh, this takes time. So the best would be a patient, for example, coming from uh, Trincomalee or Andhradapura, the uh, early part of uh, uh, stimulation can be done in wherever she stays so that uh, the Patients, if the patient wants, the patient can maybe negotiate with the pharmacy or a pharmaceutical company, get a discount for the drugs. The patient can get the drugs lo locally, so the traveling and then the uh, loss of who, uh, work, all that, the cost, uh, uh, the indirect cost of this, uh, the traveling cost, all can be reduced. But unfortunately, we know and uh, some of our patients have shown us photographs of uh, some of the vials or the box, drugs they have used. And you can't read the name. The name is not there in English. And uh, we got some of them translated to see these drugs are not registered in Sri Lanka. Of course, they are the drug, but it's brought in probably bad. So we don't know about uh, how safe, I mean, whether some of this, if they need the cold chain, whether they are maintained and they have been charged exorbitant amounts. So this, the start itself, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, 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 really um, patient is being uh, like robbed from the start. So giving a drug, an inferior quality drug, uh, which is not registered and which, which, which the drug is not being brought in the proper way and you're charging more than the original drug. So original branded drug. I think it's, uh, it's a really shame on the medical profession when such things happen and it's very unfair by patient. Then 
Um, so uh, then what protocol you use? Long protocol or short or so minimal stimulation protocol is better because the cost is low, less chance of ovarian hyperstimulation, less chance of multiple pregnancy rates, but there is a problem that uh, the, com uh, the, the live birth rate is slightly lower than uh, uh, long protocol. So still um, uh, considering these three, it can be uh, the cost and less ovarian hyperstimulation and low multiple pregnancy rates, it can be justified. Then uh, this ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome uh, with the uh, ascites, pleural refusion, um, increased liver enzymes, electrolyte imbalance, hypovolumia with and renal involvement. Now, um, when we work in the periphery, uh, the, these uh, patients, we see these patients coming in quite early. And the, the mainly they go to medical boards. Now, because the patient is not aware that her ovarian stimulation can cause this condition. So they and they're never been told if these symptoms are developed to seek advice from a gynecologist. So we see casualty admissions going into medical ward, even they are unaware. And uh, patients are, uh, will come to us quite late. So uh, uh, this really endangers the patient's life. Uh, this is something seriously that the IVF practitioners should consider. Uh, and sometimes there are no records. The records are with the IVF center. We don't know what drug, what dose, what is the due when the patient uh, has got this uh, drug. So the mortality and morbidity can be high. And at uh, the end of the day, it is we who get the... Uh, blame for not diagnosing because the patient is unaware and un until such time we find it uh, the IVF practitioner does, uh, doesn't face this uh, any of these uh, problems it is we who face this problem then when it comes to oocyte retrieval and fertilization patient is unaware patient is more <laughs> unaware of the actual number of oocytes re, uh, retrieved. And patient is unaware again, the number of embryos fertilized. This is not a mistake, this is done deliberately. For example, if somebody has 15 oocytes or 10 oocytes retrieved, and uh, they at least say eight embryos made. Uh, so you trans, uh, you, uh, um, trans about two embryos, there is like a net profit or there are about six embryos remaining, which some they, they call a profit, uh, human embryos. And then they can sell them to others. So, and also if they have problematic patients where patients demand success. So without consent, they, they transfer uh, uh, donor embryos. So the patient is happy, but sometimes blood groups are matched so that even at, so like at birth it's missed it can be missed and unless you do genetic studies no one will go to do genetic studies uh, to see whether after spending so much and so much hope and what is in your mother will my mother, a baby in your womb you're not going to do a genetic study and find out whether it is yours or husband so um, so this uh, and also these oocytes are sold because um, now there are people who come with uh, with poor ovarian reserves. So this is another uh, unethical source of oocytes for um, uh, uh, ethical source without consent from the donor, nor the uh, donor that oocytes are used. So either so they are basically sold. Then uh, similarly uh, with embryos. So if you declare lesser number of embryos, uh, so if you have eight embryos fertilized and you say you have only three or four, and if those four fails, of uh, that's a couple, although they have had eight, they will have to go for a new IVF cycle. 
because those four embryos will be transferred or sold to others. So uh, when it comes to embryo transfer, uh, blastocyst stage uh, offers more live, uh, live birth rates. So the more mature the embryo, the success is high, but at the same time, the constraint there is most embryos may not come to that stage. So uh, then uh, which states to uh, transfer and the number of embryos to be transferred differs according to age. So it depends on the each center's uh, success rates and the research available. So um, what is, I have just given some uh, number of embryos because the lower the number of embryo, lower the multiple pregnancies, lower the, uh, so then when you have lower the multiple pregnancy, higher the success rate for live births. And uh, unconsented transfers uh, are done. Um, so, so sometimes the patient is told there are two embryos are being transferred, but actually three are transferred because uh, then the success is high. And even in, when it comes to multiple pregnancies, they can always say, uh, you know, it's a, it's a division because the patient is not aware of uh, the real outcome after transfer. So we need uh, in vitro fertilization with intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which is called it's where you insert the um, sperm material into the ovum. Um, so uh, now if the male partner has, uh, so if the nature has decided to, uh, the form of a barrier uh, to propagate these genes, so if when X is done, you forcibly send the genetic material. So um, the uh, risks of uh, um, IVF by X compared to conventional com method is higher. So in a conventional uh, method, you have the ovum and the sperms in a petri dish and the sperms will go and uh, fertilize the ovum. So the, they are the, the best sperm, or is it like it's a, it's a form of a natural selection. Whereas ICSI, you force uh, the uh, nuclear material, uh, genetic material, and this is um, these are worse if uh, even you are using donor sperms and using ICSI, and in case if the donor sperm has some genetic defects, uh, ICSI will uh, really will produce a set of offsprings with genetic defects. And we, we have seen, uh, it's very sad to say, and uh, uh, it's a shame that uh, patients have been charged uh, for, um, uh, for IVF or, uh, and only IUIs are being done. Uh, this is not what I have experienced. Uh, our, all, our colleagues who practice have experienced this uh, set of unethical practices. So uh, when it comes to um, donor sperm, use of donor ovum and sperms, now we have two types of uh, gamete donors. So now say the sister is, uh, one sister is subfertile and she has endometriosis. The other sister gives uh, donor. So it's a family member, one of her best friend uh, gives. So it's not a commercial one. So the, that donation will be maximum, will be limited to one, or maybe that sister might give it to another sister or another, maybe twice. But we have the commercial donors. That is, they are paid, they come, they give donors. Now, mind you, now what happens is this woman, maybe once in two months, three months, continuously gives ovum and sometimes maybe 10 of them because they call the people whom they get the best yield. That is like you are getting the best salesman who makes the best sale. Similarly, they get the people who gives them the, gives the center the best yield. So as a result, so 
Now you are, though the different person is carrying the baby, the biological, the, the ovum are from a single person. So basically one mother is giving rise to so many uh, uh, offsprings a month or maybe annually. So if you take, now what is the range of the eyes, uh, the, what happens? If these children marry each other, so one mother, so the maybe the uh, sperms are from the husband, so the the one do in a, uh, egg donor having multi, uh, maybe many many uh, sperms uh, fertilized with many sperms. However, the same uh, the maternal genotype is the same. So so one day if they marry. So it's, it's like marrying one mother's uh, children from different fathers. Similarly, now we have the sperm donors. Uh, again, they call, they, uh, call people whom, who, who is like the best, like who gets, uh, whose sperms give the best success rates. So again, uh, now we have a set of a single father giving rise to so many children. So uh, as a result, uh, the again, the, as I said earlier, the genetic uh, so uh, same fathers children with different mothers marrying each other, and it's worse if they when they use commercial mothers and commercial fathers, where the ovum also commercially given and the donor sperms both, and maybe so very similar genotype children might marry each other. So these are the controversies there. And uh, when it comes to sperm, then when it comes to ovum sharing, now, uh, now there are two kinds. One is uh, the, the, what is practices. If one woman has ovum and no money, and the other woman has money and no ovum, so the person who uh, has uh, money and has no ovum will pay, they share the Ovum. So that is ovum sharing. That is, so but what, what really happens is they hire these ovum donors and many people say pay the same amount. So the, it's actually not the cost, it's a cost split among five, four, five people. Each person pays the full cost of ovarian stimulation. So as a result, there's a huge profit um, uh, gain from this uh, process. So they are, and also they uh, discourage, so this IVF centers discourage friends or family members being as uh, ovum donors. Uh, the main reason being they cannot uh, unethically there because then you can't charge like then the, only that person gets a drug, drug and that uh, whoever uh, recipient will get is entitled to all the ovums. Here is everybody pays the same cost for a few number of ovum, sometimes maybe as little as two or three or one. So uh, now there are IVF done where the patient has no ovum, the man, the man has no uh, sperms. So why go for uh, donor ovum, donor sperm? Because end of the day, you are creating a completely different embryo. It's neither a uh, couples, mother or father. So it is better, cost effective. And also you uh, less, far less side effects when you go for uh, donor embryo transfers. Because then the ovarian hyperstimulation, uh, oocyte retrieval, all the, that part of the complications uh, and the cost is avoided. It's just the cost of or uh, whatever you pay for the frozen embryo. But uh, this is the uh, what, but what is recommended is not this. It's again a controversy. Then when it comes to surrogation, now um, now surrogacy. Uh, now actually, this is a very con a very uh, um, uh, difficult area where, uh, say for example, uh, if a sister is uh, has had a uh, is not able to has gametes 
or has a woman and is, uh, there's an issue with the uterus, uterine aging is some form of uterine abnormality, whatever reason. So then we need to get a uterus. So for surrogacy to, uh, for implant it, for the baby to develop. Now, um, the best would be to get a relative or the patient to find, I know it's, it can be difficult, but what happens is now there are women who are uh, ready for surrogacy. And this is again a commercial basis. So uh, the couple pays a large amount for surrogacy and the patient gets a very small amount, well, not the patient, the woman who offers surrogacy gets a relatively a small amount. Uh, so again, the IVF centers make a huge margin, but that person with every pregnancy, every year, uh, her risk to the her risk to her life because of multiple pregnancies increases proportionately, and her life is at risk. Then. Uh, inappropriate use of or abuse of drugs. So if you, uh, there are certain estrogens and progesterones are needed for maintenance after fertilization. But uh, if you go through drugs, uh, cheats or regimes of IVF centers, virtually every patient has in addition aspirin and low molecular weight heparin. Even for a primate that has, has no, had no medical problems, never uh, uh, flat rate, everybody is virtually given low molecular heparin. And we see clinic, these patients coming at casual depression with torrential bleeding, uh, sometimes endangering their life. As, uh, they, they don't follow standard protocols and they don't hand over these patients on time to a obstetrician. Uh, they, on their own, they get down the patient wherever they are or they keep the patient and give these drugs and virtually every patient gets the cervical circlage whether indicated or not. Then uh, unethical or unscientific surgeries are done. Now I, I have seen, I have discussed with my colleagues, there is this tubal clipping or, or self injectomies being done. So basically either you obstruct the tube or you remove the tube. Now this is done on the context of hydrocelpines, but if you check their records, there is not a HSG, some or the laparoscopy where you can see uh, documented by a qualified, proper qualified gynecologist stating there is uh, hydrocelphings uh, uh, that been diagnosed. Some people uh, take the consent, the counsel the patient by doing 3D scans and showing the patient. The poor patient doesn't know, has seen the 3D scan for the first time. And they say, why you need laparoscopies? Why you need this? I am sure of my findings, but but is it possible or is it somebody who has never had surgeries, who have never had PIDs, uh, never had endometriosis? And the worst thing is the person who has scanned and who comes to the cons uh, conclusion is not uh, uh, both certified gynecologist, not a subfertility patient, not a radiologist. It's just an IVF person. And they con consent the patient and the patient, poor patient, doesn't realize the consequences and they are forced to consent and the patient with good faith consents and they have these surgeries. And uh, the another thing with where patients uh, who have diagnosis cards or already diagnosed with grade four endometriosis, no ovarian tissue, frozen pelvis, <coughs> and uh, uh, documented no ovarian tissue left. They are having uh, oocyte retrievals. We have managed severe sepsis 
in patients where oocytes have been retrieved with severe endometriosis, uh, with infection, life-threatening, some of them had massive ovarian abscesses, some of them had near deaths, and uh, uh, how ethical and is, I don't, is, is questionable. And also, uh, when you really know this kind of a patient, you are unable to retrieve over, uh, over his uh, or follicles, why not go for uh, donor uh, oocytes rather than uh, uh, trying a procedure that will not benefit the patient? Uh, then uh, issues uh, associated with uh, multiple pregnancies. So um, the present recommendation is to avoid international recommendation, multiple pregnancies as much as possible. Lowest, least number of embryos should be transferred um, because the uh, uh, procedure associated the uh, multiple pregnancies will cause miscarriages, preterm deliveries, then you get gestational hypertensive disorders and di gestational diabetes. Now, this is on top of uh, aggravating the existing medical conditions. Some of these uh, uh, now, um, when it comes to uh, the, this uh, BMI, I would like to now talk to uh, about uh, BMI modulation. Now, extremes of BMI as very bad outcome on or adverse outcome on fertility because of the differences in the ratios of estradiol and estrion they make. The amount of total amount of estrogen they make. Then the inhibin activing ratios. Uh, they are uh, progesterone production. So virtually that is ovulation and then um, the multiple effects of insulin-like growth factors and their binding proteins. And uh, with obesity, leptin levels are very high. So all this together uh, and the insulin resistance in polycystic ovary syndrome or the lean polycystic with the androgenics. So extremes of BMI has very detrimental effect on normal pregnancies on spontaneous normal pregnancy. So control of BMI alone is adequate by the diet, the not diet, it's a medical nutrition therapy and exercise will um, increase fertility rates. So if a person has a real indication for IVF, as I have mentioned earlier, like tuber peritoneal disease, poor sperm quality, uh, then they have, uh, uh, that's such patients will also benefit uh, by, uh, uh, mod by mod um, changing or coming to a better, the ideal to get, get into a better BMI, to get, to get a BMI of ideal range. So, um, uh, and uh, the, hormone profile, the adverse correction of the adverse hormone profile itself will greatly um, help. And uh, so uh, in summary, what I have to say is uh, in Sri Lanka, IVF is grossly abused in most centers. Uh, this is uh, similar to our neighboring countries uh, where um, I'm not saying in neighboring countries it doesn't happen, but I'm referring to countries with like Singapore, uh, UK, um, uh, Japan or USA where there is a, where there are standards. So our main issue is starting from the process we have no law to control it so and we have so when you don't have a law standards everybody can do ivf and that damages or tarnish the reputation of people who do it the proper way and the, 
and the unethical way of uh, forcing patients into IVF when it is not indicated. And when the patient selection and decision, the making is done by IVF practitioners who are neither gynecologists or neither subfertility, uh, subfertility consultants, specialists in subfertility. Uh, and uh, also, unfortunately, some of our own colleagues send subfertility patients to them. Uh, the reason being subfertility consume time. So if you have a busy practice, it is better to uh, send them to uh, somebody who has time to do that. In return, you get the patient, you get the pregnant patients. But uh, I really wonder uh, how ethical this practice, I think the, uh, this needs to be um, uh, regularized. Anybody having IVF, the initial form, part of stimulation, it is safer to be done by the, not the done under the supervision of the uh, gynecologist of that area, because in, in the event of a problem with the treatment schedule and ovarian hyperstimulation, there is somebody responsible who knows about the patient. And also at the same time, uh, local administration of drugs, the cost and the patient uh, uh, inconvenience, time wasting, the other cost can be reduced. And uh, IVA should be something, is very something very valuable, should be practiced the proper way by the proper people in proper centers. The, the, so there should be regulation. I think the medical council uh, can play a major role with the relevant, our college of obstetricians and gynecologists uh, with the input of uh, our college of, uh, Sri Lanka College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Uh, we can also get help from uh, international bodies to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for that very informative presentation. It's time to lighten few queries. Please write your questions clearly in the chat box using standard abbreviations. So we have a few queries. So the first question is, what is the role of IVF in a patient with karyotyping problem, male and female separately? What would, what would be the chance of success? Um. Karyotype prob uh, problems. Now, uh, if it is uh, translocation, if the karyotype problem is due to a translocation, it will recur. If it is, uh, if the patient has got it, uh, if, if it is non disjunction, then the chances are low. So um, this, this uh, question, uh, I think, uh, should be uh, better answered by a clinical genet uh, gen uh, genetist. Uh, as I'm a general, generalist in uh, OBS and Gaini, uh, it's a more of a technical question because it's a general answer is very difficult. Uh, dif it's, uh, difficult. Thank you, sir. A few more queries. Uh, is there any way that inadequately qualified medical professionals being ligated with regard to this issue? Uh, litigation. Yes, litigation. Yes, it's actually for what has happened. The we are aware the police, uh, the um, relevant authorities, the medical council. Uh, they have adequate information. Um, unfortunately, uh, some of these procedures have been done by the consenting, the explanation, the consenting has been done by the IVF center. So the procedure has been done by the, done by a qualified person. So then the, the, the attorney general department or whoever, the police department will have the question 
who is responsible is it the person who uh, who consented and who to who explained and consented or who should be litigated who whoever did the procedure so when you are asked to do a procedure whether you should the whoever did the procedure should take a separate history see the patient and decide whether the procedure is needed or not is the question there it, so if it is if if that is not done then i am uh, then it's a issue basically what i'm saying is if if the decision has been made to do whatever the surgical procedure and the patient consented somebody or obstetrician is asked to do it he comes and do, uh, gynecologist will do the procedure that is one way second thing is correctly speaking that uh, gynecologist before doing the procedure should check whether he should whether he should do the procedure or not so if it if if that has not been done then it's another issue so uh, this is a re reason why they are protected in a way because they themselves have not done the procedure uh, where wherever this issues have come up i hey, hope i'm clear yes sir thank you so much uh, one more question what is the cost roughly for ivf procedure in sri lanka so, so it's a very interesting, interesting question when you go there and sit in front of this is what has been told to me by my patients uh, because i am board certified from 2006 and i am practicing up to date um, when you go there is 280000 to 300000 Uh, when you start, when you talk, and when you start paying, it's about six hundred to seven hundred thousand. After the first procedure, it's about a million. Then they once it fails, it's about another one point five million. And then uh, sometimes uh, there there are instances where they have paid two million, two point five million, no success. So uh, the cost depends on I think the mood of the IVF practitioner that sees you, and some of these people have CCTV cameras and they know which vehicle you are coming. and from where you are you are there. so they they are cctv will tell, will determine your cost so i think if anybody is going for i we better to go in a push cycle or a motorcycle your cost will be low please don't go in very high fi vehicle they can see you and please talk in singular so that your cost will be less that's all i can say for the from the experience what i have had thank you so much sir <laughs> Uh, the last question from the participant is uh, is uh, surrogation is legal in sri lanka no uh, it is not legal to my knowledge best of my knowledge it's uh, not legal thank you sir uh, if there are no more queries i would like to thank dr maitri chandaratna for his excellent and informative presentation on behalf of the gmoa and society for health research and innovation also we would like to present a talk on appreciation for him on behalf of gmoa and society for health research and innovation uh, thank you very much sir uh, and thank you all for your participations also uh, during this hard time um, Have a good day. We are concluding our sessions today. Stay safe and stay healthy.